Over the past 50 years, more and more women have entered the workforce, and they're increasingly taking on jobs that have traditionally gone to men. Now, new research shows that the women's fathers may be having an influence on what those jobs are. Researchers from North Carolina State University and the University of Maryland examined three large surveys conducted from 1973 to 2002. More than 40,000 women had taken part. They included women born from 1909 to 1977, three generations over three quarters of a century. This broad examination of women's roles clearly showed a rise in what had been male-dominated fields, but the surveys also contained information on what jobs the fathers held. And it turned out, as time progressed, there was a distinct change. Women born in the 1970s were three times more likely to follow in their dad's footsteps. Researchers can't say exactly what this means about father-daughter relationships. Maybe dads are investing more time in educating their daughters. Maybe they're talking more about their own jobs. But dads and daughters appear to be taking career paths that bridge both the generation and gender gaps. and mental well-being. But a good workout can actually influence the mental well-being of others, too, because bosses who hit the gym tend to be less abusive to their employees. That's according to a study in the Journal of Business and Psychology. Researchers asked 98 MBA students who were also employed full-time to rate how their supervisors treated them by responding to statements like, my boss puts me down in front of others. The researchers also had supervisors fill out a different survey about their stress levels and weekly exercise. And as the authors expected, the more stressed out supervisors were, the more their employees felt belittled by them. But the employees felt better about bosses who exercised, whether it was yoga, cardio, or weightlifting. And just one or two days a week did the trick. Exercise didn't simply melt away the stress. Bosses who worked out reported feeling just as much pressure as their sedentary counterparts. Active bosses just spared subordinates the verbal attacks. So next time you feel like telling your boss to take a hike, it might actually be sound advice. Evidence shows that a simple view of nature can radically improve health outcomes. So why couldn't we design a hospital where every patient had a window with a view? Simple, site-specific designs can make a hospital that heals. Designing it is one thing. Getting it built, we learned, learned is quite another. Uh, we worked with Bruce Nizet, a brilliant engineer, and he thought about construction differently than I had been taught in school. 
when we had to excavate this enormous hilltop, and a bulldozer was expensive and hard to get to site, Bruce suggested doing it by hand, using a method in Rwanda called ubudehe, which means community works for the community. Hundreds of people came with shovels and hoes, and we excavated that hill in half the time and half the cost of that bulldozer. Instead of importing furniture, Bruce started a guild. And he brought in master carpenters to train others and how to make furniture by hand. And on this job site, 15 years after the Rwandan genocide, Bruce insisted that we bring on labor from all backgrounds and that half of them be women. Bruce was using the process of building to heal, not just for those who were sick, but for the entire community as a whole. We call this the locally fabricated way of building, or lofab. And it has、uh, four pillars: hire locally, source regionally, train where you can, and most importantly, think about every design decision as an opportunity to invest in the dignity of the places and where you serve. It's been reported recently that some business schools have decided to make changes to students' grades by increasing them by 10 percent. This means that a C grade automatically becomes a B, and a B grade automatically becomes an A under the new grading system. And the change is retrospective, which means that it applies to all grades that have been achieved since the school's current grading system,、uh, which was introduced in 2007, has been in place. Now there are at least eight business schools who've changed their grading levels, and they decided to award their graduates higher grades so they would be more attractive in the highly competitive job market. However, changing grades like this has been criticized by the academic and business communities because many people think the grades have been falsely exaggerated and don't reflect the true ability of the student. In fact, many employers realize when a school has made adjustments to students' grades, and so there is no real benefit in doing this.、Um, lifting the grades may even be damaging to the students because employers may believe that the graduates were given the high grades when they didn't deserve them.
With us in the studio today is Dr. Gavin Matter, child psychologist and author of Raising Kids. So I'd like to start by asking about children and their attachment relationships. Yes, well, first of all, let's look at what attachment is. And basically, it is closeness with another human being. And it's important for us as adults. We are programmed biologically to connect with other people and form emotional attachments. You just need to think about how devastating it can be when our closest attachment relationships are severed, or even just threatened. As adults, we can be devastated, and we may even tailspin into depression or illness. Now, looking at children, recent research shows that an optimal environment for child rearing was achieved in hunter-gatherer societies. And what you have in those societies is not isolated parents living in a nuclear family setting, separate from extended family, from clan, from culture. What you have back then is much broader parenting arrangements. It takes a whole village to raise a child. Yes, exactly. Experiencing a love-hate relationship with social media. Some are using it to their advantage. They're reaching more customers, increasing sales, and improving their brand image through social networking sites. They're also using them for recruitment. On the other hand, many employers continue to see the bad side of social media and believe that it poses a threat to their business. Negative comments online can damage a brand, and employers also worry that employees might spend too much time online during working hours, stopping them from working effectively and completing all their tasks. But this problem provides employers with an opportunity. 
Employees who spend a lot of time on social networking sites do it because they're bored. They don't feel challenged and want to fill their time. This suggests that employers should take a more active role in providing development opportunities for their staff and setting new goals. This way, they can benefit from the advantages of social media without experiencing the difficulties. Researchers were interested in the question of how primates suss out social relationships, knowledge that can come in handy for maneuvering within a complex society. To assess how the macaques obtain and make use of such social know-how, the researchers decided to focus on episodes of aggression, a common feature of simian interactions. They went through more than 500 hours of video recordings showing the exchanges that took place in a group of 57 macaques living in the Rome Zoo monkeys whose genealogical ties are well known. And they parsed some 15,000 episodes of aggression, noting the relationships among the individuals involved. First, they confirmed that monkeys that find themselves at the receiving end of aggression tend to turn around and take it out on a third party. And that retaliation is often directed at a relative of the original aggressor. But how do the monkeys determine who's kin? Well, one way would be that they've been around long enough to have watched each other grow up but that doesn't seem to be the case. When researchers looked specifically at conflicts involving older monkeys, it didn't seem that relatives were singled out for revenge. What does seem to be true is that victims will target their attacker's associates, the other monkeys he hangs around with. Well, if they're not his relatives, they're probably his cronies, so close enough. Interestingly, there's a benefit to hitting family members when you're meeting out justice. Macaques that sought out the kin of the monkeys they wanted to settle a score with were less likely to be picked on again in the future. Whereas wailing on the friends appeared to offer only present satisfaction, but no such future protection. Which suggests, if you're gonna beat on someone for payback, it should at least be a monkey's uncle. It may sound strange, but scientists are celebrating the survival and spread of tens of thousands of mosquitoes they released in northeastern Australia. The whole thing makes more sense when you know that these mosquitoes are not just any run-of-the-mill bloodsuckers. They're weaponized, infected with a type of bacteria that prevents the spread of Zika, Dengue, and other mosquito-borne viruses. The bacterium, called Wolbachia, is present naturally in nearly two-thirds of all insect species 
Although it's not usually found in Aedes aegypti, the mosquito responsible for spreading Zika, Dengue, Yellow Fever, and Chikungunya. But when researchers introduced Wolbachia into mosquitoes in the lab a decade ago, the bacteria bollocks the skeeters, making them unable to transmit their viruses to humans. Which gives public health experts hope that by releasing big groups of Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes into problem areas, they'll spread Wolbachia to the local populations, making them incapable of transmitting viral diseases to people. But a big question was, will the weaponized mosquitoes remain contained where they're let loose, or will they move enough to mingle with their wild brethren? So researchers in Australia ran a test. In 2013, they released some 35,000 Wolbachia carrying Aedes aegypti at one site, 131,000 at a second site, and 286,000 at a third site, all in the city of Cairns. And they tracked the insect's dispersal. Seems the souped-up skeeters spread outward from the two larger introduction areas at a slow but steady rate of about 100 to 200 meters per year. The mosquitoes in the smaller group stayed put. The studies in the journal PLOS Biology. The results indicate that Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes could be effective against viral diseases if, like bug spray, they're applied liberally over larger areas. You're strolling down the street, or maybe hauling that load of laundry down a flight of stairs, when all of a sudden, your laces come undone. If you've ever pondered what precipitates this pedestrian wardrobe malfunction, you might want to tie your shoes and beat a path to the proceedings of the Royal Society A. In that journal, researchers have trotted out data that show that a combination of whipping and stomping forces is what causes laces to unravel without warning. The investigators noted that shoelace knots frequently fail when people are walking, but not when they're, say, sitting on the edge of a table and swinging their legs. Laces also stay tight when marching in place with no forward motion. That led the gumshoes to suspect that stepping and swinging somehow work together to foil footwear security. But how? To untangle this knotty problem, the researchers made a slow-mo video of a student running on a treadmill thus recording the literal steps that lead to catastrophic knot failure. Here's what they slowly saw. When the foot strikes the ground, the force of the impact causes the knot at the center of the lace to deform and stretch. And when the foot swings forward, the ends of the shoelace fly forward. That whipping motion pulls the knot open a bit more, which allows the free end of the lace to slip through a tiny bit. With each cycle of impact and whip, the free end slides a little more until enough of it has come through that the knot finally unravels. The researchers confirm that some knots are stronger than others. The granny knot that most of us use on our shoes is fairly weak and prone to failure, perhaps because the knot winds up twisted when pulled tight. A square knot, on the other hand, held up well in the treadmill test. To get that knot to buckle, the researchers had to attach weights to the free ends to aid in the tugging of those whipping tips. The researchers did not determine whether different types of laces are more likely to produce ties that bind.
In March 2007, the European Union, as have other territories before and since, agreed to phase out the use of incandescent light bulbs due to the facts that they waste around 95% of their energy on heat and that they consume up to four times as much electricity as new compact fluorescent light bulbs. Often referred to as CFLs, this new breed of light bulb is gradually becoming the norm and is allowing countries to significantly reduce their CO2 emissions. Replacing all the incandescent light bulbs in Europe with CFLs reduces CO2 output by 50 million tonnes and is equivalent to the benefit of planting 10 million acres of forest. However, CFLs do nonetheless have critics. As you may have experienced yourselves, the light produced by CFLs can often be noticeably dimmer than that produced by traditional, old-fashioned light bulbs. You may think CFLs are just too dim, like some others have argued. They are also more expensive, though their cost is decreasing as they become more popular, and some people think they are ugly. Summer's here, and it won't be long before school-aged kids across America start complaining that they're tired of riding their bikes, playing at the park, swimming in the pool, and all the other awesome activities their parents hoped would keep them entertained for the next ten weeks. Well, if it's any consolation, such rapid-onset boredom could indicate that the kids have amazing powers of recall. Because a new study shows that the better your short-term memory, the faster you feel sated and decide you've had enough. The findings appear in the Journal of Consumer Research. Though satiation can be physical, like when you feel full after eating too much, we were interested in the psychological side of satiation, like when you're just tired of something. Noelle Nelson, Assistant Professor of Marketing and Consumer Behavior at the University of Kansas School of Business. She and her colleague Joseph Redden at the University of Minnesota tried to think outside the lunchbox. Something that was interesting to me was that some people get tired of the same things at very different rates. So if you think about pop songs on the radio, some people must still be enjoying them and requesting them even after hearing them a lot. But a lot of other people are really sick of those same songs. The difference the researchers posited might have to do with memories of past consumption. For example, studies showed that people push away from the dinner table sooner when they're asked to describe in detail what they ate earlier for lunch. So the researchers tested the memory capacity of undergraduates. The students then viewed a repeating series of three classic paintings, like The Starry Night, American Gothic, and The Scream, or listened and re-listened to a series of three pop songs, or three pieces of classical music. Throughout the test, the participants were intermittently asked to rate their experience on a scale of 0 to 10. And the better a participant scored in the memory test, the faster they got bored. So remembering more details actually makes the participants feel like they've experienced the art or music more often. The findings suggest that marketers could manipulate our desire for their products by figuring out ways to distract us and keep us from fully remembering our experiences. We could also trick ourselves into eating less junk food by immersing ourselves in the memory of a previous snack.
Some people may just be born with a talent for math. I mean, we've known that practicing your times tables makes for better multiplication. But new research shows that our inborn sense of numbers is linked to our math ability, even before any training in math. Researchers gave 200 four-year-olds tests of number sense, which is the ability to guess quantities without counting. In this test, kids watched groups of blue and yellow dots flash on a computer screen and had to guess which color was more numerous. Some comparisons were obvious, like two blue and eight yellow. Others were tough, like five blue and six yellow. Researchers also tested the children's basic math skills. Kids who could judge that a group of six yellow dots is larger than a group of five blue dots were also better at arithmetic, meaning that number sense correlated with basic math skills, even in preschoolers. The study appears in the journal Developmental Science. Good number sense in adolescence was thought to be linked to good instruction. But it turns out from this study that the link between good number sense and good math skills exists before any instruction. Today we're going to look at an important area of science, namely nanotechnology. So, what is it? Nano means tiny, so it's science and engineering on the scale of atoms and molecules. The idea is that by controlling and rearranging atoms, you can literally create anything. However, as we'll see, the science of the small has some big implications, affecting us in many ways. There's no doubt that nanotechnology promises so much for civilization. However, all new technologies have their teething problems. And with nanotechnology, society often gets the wrong idea about its capabilities. Numerous science fiction books and movies have raised people's fears about nanotechnology, with scenarios such as inserting little nanorobots into your body that monitor everything you do without you realising it, or self-replicating nanorobots that eventually take over the world. So, how do we safeguard such a potentially powerful technology? Some scientists recommend that nanoparticles be treated as new chemicals, with separate safety tests and clear labelling. They believe that greater care should also be taken with nanoparticles in laboratories and factories. Others have called for a withdrawal of new nanoproducts, such as cosmetics, and a temporary halt to many kinds of nanotech research. But as far as I'm concerned, there's a need to plough ahead with the discoveries and applications of nanotechnology. I really believe that most scientists would welcome a way to guard against unethical uses of such technology. We can't go around thinking that all innovation is bad, all advancement is bad. As with the debate about any new technology, it is how you use it that's important.
biologists still don't know how serious the threat to their survival is for each individual species. So, a body called the Global Marine Species Assessment is now creating a list of endangered species on land, so they consider things like the size of the population, how many members of one species there are in a particular place, and then they look at their distribution in geographical terms. Although this is quite difficult when you're looking at fish because they're so mobile, and then thirdly, they calculate the rate at which the decline of the species is happening. So far, only 1,500 species have been assessed, but they want to increase this figure to 20,000. For each one they assess, they use the data they collect on that species to produce a map showing its distribution. Ultimately, they will be able to use these to figure out not only where most species are located, but also where they are most threatened. So, finally, what can be done to retain the diversity of species in the world's oceans? Firstly, we need to set up more reserves in our oceans, places where marine species are protected. We have some, but not enough. In addition. To preserve species such as leatherback turtles, which live out in the high seas but have their nesting sites on the American coast, we need to create corridors for migration, so they can get from one area to another safely. As well as this, action needs to be taken to lower the levels of fishing quotas to prevent overfishing of endangered species. And finally, there's the problem of bycatch. This refers to the catching of unwanted fish by fishing boats. They're returned to the sea, but they're often dead or dying. If these commercial fishing boats used equipment which was more selective, so that only the fish wanted for consumption were caught, this problem could be overcome. Business leaders generally try to do the right thing, but all too often the right thing backfires if those leaders adopt values without understanding and managing the side effects that arise. The values can easily get in the way of what's actually intended. Okay, so the first value I'm going to discuss is collaboration.、Uh, let me give you an example. On a management training course I once attended, we were put into groups and had to construct a bridge across a stream using building blocks that we were given. The rule was that everyone in the team had to move at least one building block during the construction. This was intended to encourage teamwork, but it was really a job best done by one person. The other teams tried to collaborate on building the structure and descended into confusion. With everyone getting in each other's way, our team leader solved the challenge brilliantly. She simply asked everyone in the team to move a piece a few centimeters to comply with the rule, and then let the person in the team with an aptitude for puzzles like this build it alone. We finished before any other team. My point is that the task wasn't really suited to team working, so why make it one? Teamwork can also lead to inconsistency, a common cause of poor sales. In the case of a smartphone that a certain company launched, one director wanted to target the business market, and another demanded it was aimed at consumers. 
The company wanted both directors to be involved, so gave the product a consumer-friendly name, but marketed it to companies. The result was that it met the needs of neither group. It would have been better to let one director or the other have his way, not both. Dr. Tony Wagner believes there are seven skills that young people need to have in order for them to find and keep a good job in today's economy. But he thinks our schools are focusing too much on tests and academic performance and aren't doing enough to teach those skills. Let me give you an example. One of Wagner's seven skills is the ability to work in an international team. This is because little teamwork is carried out in one building anymore. When most global companies have a problem, they create teams of people from all over the world to solve it. And these people meet online, in virtual meeting rooms. To succeed in this kind of environment, you need to be a good communicator and understand different cultures. Teams also need good leaders, who lead by influencing others, but Wagner and the business people he interviewed say that young people today are unprepared for teamwork and leadership. Because of this, Wagner thinks that people involved in teaching and learning must rethink the way that they educate people in schools so that these young people have the skills they need to achieve a successful career in the 21st century. Where did this idea of evolution come from? Well, uh, there, there are always ideas. Uh, you can go back to Aristotle and find elements of evolutionary thought in Aristotle. But really, it's a 19th century idea. And in order to, to see how it developed, let's go back to about 1790 or 1800. So at the end of the century of the Enlightenment, at that point, if you were to ask a well-educated person living in a Western culture how old the world is, they would say, oh, thousands of years. And if you were to ask them, well, where did all these species on the planet come from? They would say they were all created just the way they look now, and they've never changed. 
And if you ask them, have there ever been any species that went extinct? They would say no. Everything that was created is still alive and can be found somewhere on the planet. So when Alexander von Humboldt, who was certainly a creature of the Enlightenment, sets out to explore South America, he thinks that he might encounter some of those strange fossils that the French have been turning up in the Paris Basin on top of a tepway in Venezuela. So he really thought that there was a lost world. Of course, Arthur Conan Doyle later wrote a novel about that. But I mean, these guys actually thought, hey, I go to Venezuela or I go to the Congo, I might meet a brontosaurus. That was what they thought. You can get a good qualification in journalism, but what employers actually want is practical rather than theoretical knowledge. There's no substitute for creating real stories that have to be handed in by strict deadlines. So write for your school magazine. Then maybe try your hand at editing. Once you've done that for a while, start requesting internships in newspapers in the area. These are generally short-term and unpaid, but they're definitely worthwhile. Since, instead of providing you with money, they'll teach you the skills that every 21st century journalist has to have, like laying out articles, creating web pages, taking good digital pictures, and so on. Most reporters keep a copy of every story they've, they've had published, from secondary school onwards. They're called cuttings, and you need them to get a job. Indeed, a few impressive ones can be the deciding factor in whether you're appointed or not. So start creating a portfolio now that will show off your developing talent. Long-term exposure to noise can lead to loss of hearing. The relative loudness of sounds is measured in decibels. Just to give you an idea of what this means, the sound of a whisper is 30 decibels, while a normal conversation is 60 decibels. The noise a, vac the noise a vacuum cleaner makes is around 85 decibels. The danger zone, the risk of injury, begins at around 90 Continual exposure to sounds above 90 decibels can damage your hearing. Loud noises, especially when they come at you every day, 
All this noise can damage the delicate hair cells in your inner ear. Lots of everyday noises are bad for us in the long run. For example, a car horn sounds at around 100 decibels. A rock band at close range is 125 decibels. A jet engine at close range is one of the worst culprits at an ear-busting 140 decibels. The first thing to go is your high-frequency hearing, where you detect the consonant sounds in words. That's why a person with hearing loss can hear voices, but has trouble understanding what's being said. It's common sense that some objects are harder than others. We refer to this characteristic as hardness. <clears throat> But what exactly is hardness? Let me tell you. It's the ability of a material to resist being damaged, scratched, or marred in any way. There's even a way to, there's even a way to measure it. It's the Mohs scale of hardness. A German scientist. Um, a mineralogist named Friedrich Mohs came up with the scale in 1812. Here's how he made it. Mohs took 10 different minerals. Then he rated them from 1 to 10 based on their ability to withstand damage and to damage other materials. Talc received a rating of 1. It's soft, it's easily scratched, and can hardly damage anything. Diamond received a rating of 10. It's the hardest natural substance known to man. The other objects on the scale that number from 2 to 9 are gypsum, calcite, fluoride, apatite, feldspar, quartz, topaz, and corundum. I see worried looks on your faces. <laughs> Don't worry about writing them down. They're listed on page 234 of your text. Take a look. Now, what about the hardness of other objects? Hmm, it depends on which of the ten minerals can scratch them. For instance, your fingernails get a rating of 2.5 on the Mohs scale. So talc and gypsum can't scratch them, but calcite can. Well, what are some others? Let's see. Iron is rated between 4 and 5. Glass is between 6 and 7. And steel is close to it.